Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love the neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. There is no commandment greater than these two. Pretty powerful commandments, aren't they? When we give to the Lord and in turn to others, we are doing what the Lord asks us to do. We're surrendering to Him, putting Him first. And in some way, a small way, we're showing our love to Him and to others. And that's what we're doing in the morning, this morning as we take up the tithes and offerings. So if the usher had come forward, that'd be great. Oh, if you could take up the offerings, thanks guys. And I'll pray while that's going on. Thank you, Lord, so much. Thank you that you're our rock. Our trust has to be in you, Lord. And as we give today, we thank you that we are giving a part of ourselves to you. And Lord, just sharing our love with others through what you do and what you do with these, these ties. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Kids. Kids. There's Jess. Bye, Jess. <laughs> All right. Our devotionals are still going. So they're on tomorrow night at 6.30 and then Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. Don't forget, guys. Uh, looking forward to that this week. Um, and I have a ladies gathering coming up. Um, Saturday morning, the 27th of November. 27th of November from 9 to 10. It's going to be a short one, I bet. <laughs> but it probably will be. But the sky's giving me the dirty look. I better do the right thing here. Um, it'll be here at church. And um, so you guys are gathering. I got this text that said, we are gathering. I thought, I can't say we are gathering. You are gathering for the time of worship, word and prayer. It sounds like it's going to be really good, guys. You'll be having a time of prayer for those in Afghanistan. And we'll be taking up a collection to donate to the Baptist World AIDS African Crisis. Afghanistan crisis, sorry, appeal. Where's Elton? Oh, mate, I've been following. I learn a lot and study your, <laughs> study your approach. <laughs> uh, there's an opportunity for all the women in the church to come together in prayer and fellowship. So there you go. That's again on the 27th of November from 9 to 10. And I'm just going to hand over now to Pastor Lisa, who has more information about the picnic. Awesome. Welcome to church, everyone. Neil, that was an amazing jump. Everyone love Neil's jump? That was pretty cool. An amazing worship. Thank you, team. All right, so I have baptism announcement. So listen carefully because we are not meeting in this building next Sunday. And I think I need to say this over and over again. We are not meeting in this building next Sunday. So if you show up at 10 a.m. next Sunday, the doors will be locked and you will not be coming in. So we are meeting at Woodman Point instead. Do we have the address? The address is up there. If anyone wants to take a photo of that address, take it now. So when you get to Woodman Point at 10 a.m., I mean, you can get there whatever time you want to, but we're going to start at 10 a.m. And we're going to make the deli. Yes, Jackie. Yeah, so what's it called? What it's called is John Graham. So John Graham Reserve at Woodman Point. So we are going to make the deli and the toilet area. The, it's a big building in the centre. Um, we're going to make that the meeting point. So that's going to be the meeting point at 10 a.m. So John Graham Reserve at Woodman Point. 10 to roughly 11.30 or 12. We're going to have food. So we're going to have um, something like bacon and egg wraps or something like that. So some sort of brunch. When we get down there, it's going to be some, hopefully we have some worship and hopefully some message and all that sort of stuff. But we are having baptisms. That's the main thing we're going down there for. We have four baptisms so far. It's amazing. Yes, let's give a like clap to that. So four baptisms so far. There's a little booklet here. So if you are one of the four, please come and see me to grab this booklet. 
also. It is not too late and it's not too late on the day also. So if you get there and you listen to what Pastor Clint's going to speak about baptism and you go, I really want to be baptised, don't keep quiet, put your hand up, you can get baptised that day. If you know today that you want to be baptised, please come and see me so I can give you one of these. It goes through your decision, it goes through why, it goes through all of that sort of stuff and we're also going to speak about it on the day. So if you need a lift... So it's 10 a.m. down at John Graham Reserve, Woodman Point. If you need a lift, we're going to meet here at 9.15. Shane over there is going to be driving the bus. We have 11 spaces on the bus. If we need more than that, then we have to look at carpooling. But right now we have 11 spaces. So there is a bus registry that Paul is holding up right now at the back. Please write your name and phone number down. And please meet here for 9.15. The bus will be leaving at 9.30 sharp. If you miss it, I don't know how you're going to get there if you were planning on getting there by bus. You might have to walk. It might take a while. <clears throat> Join us on the marathon next year maybe. <laughs> but anyway, you come here at 9.15 if you need a bus ride. And then we're leaving at 9.30 sharp to get down to Woodman Point for 10 a.m. So have I got everything? Also... We will not be collecting tithe that day. So keep your money. Figure out whether you're going to do it electronically, save it for the next time, however it is that you do it. But please don't bring your cash or your tithe expecting us to collect it. Just for safety measures down at the beach to bring cash, it's just, it's not good. So don't bring it down there expecting us to just go, oh, Lisa, can you just take this because I really won't take it. Then you'll be stuck with your tithe money. So don't bring it down to the beach. Figure out there's electronic ways to give in this church. There's other ways if you come the following week, whatever you do. But don't bring it down to the beach that day. There will be no one collecting your tithe. We will have welcome people and all that sort of stuff and food, but it's really a picnic. It's fellowship. It's coming together. It's witnessing amazing people that go, you know what, dead to old and rising to new. This is my faith decision that I want to make and that's what we're celebrating next Sunday is there quick any questions actually if you have questions please come and see me after all right come and see me after if you have questions otherwise we might be here all day listening to the baptism announcement but so 9 15 here at the church but that's if your name's down so you need to either see me after service or or write your name down or contact me in the week if you didn't know. And if you're online, are we online? If you're online and you actually want to get down to the uh, Woodman Point or it's John Graham Reserve Woodman Point, please contact me and I'll get you down on the bus registry list and you can meet here at 9.15 to get there at 10 a.m. No one is here next Sunday in the building. We are having a picnic. All right. I'm excited to hear Sky speak this morning. We're going to we're going to say um, hello to people for 30 seconds to a minute while she comes up here. But very excited to hear her speak our last message on the light garlic series. Who's thought this has been a bit fascinating, the light garlic when we saw it? Yeah. And Sky has a cracker of a message. Very excited to hear God speak through her this morning. So say hello to somebody that you have not said hello to this morning. And we're going to welcome Sky to the stage. Oh, and also, Pastor Clint is ministering at another church. That's the reason why he's not here. So pray for him if you think, if you can, pray for him in the message he's delivering this morning. All right, say hello to people. Chairs, picnic blankets. Chairs and picnic blankets. All right, all right, all right. You've had your 30 seconds. Take a seat. It's wonky up here. Is that supposed to be that wonky?
Thanks, Lise. Lisa's just uh, informed me, part of the baptism, bring your own picnic rugs and chairs. Otherwise, you're sitting on the sand. So bring your own picnic rugs and chairs, but food will be provided for you unless you want to bring your own snacks. Is that all? I think that's it. Or bring a towel if you want to lay back on a towel. Sounds exciting. I'm, I'm looking forward to next week. Have we got anyone being baptised as of yet? Four people. That's amazing. Yeah, you can clap that. People are turning their lives around. That's definitely worth a clap. How amazing. I've got so many things running through my head at the moment. I don't want to do a Pastor Clinton and veer off in a million directions because I know that God, God's always speaking to Pastor Clinton. He's always got so much to say. Um, but I just really felt that as um, even last night and this morning as I was, I was, it's funny, I was watching like a caravan thing, like, because we're, we're planning a big trip away. I was watching this caravan thing. I'm like, these people have been traveling for six years in a caravan. And like, a lot of people are like, no, nah. I feel like I could do that. I could live that life traveling around Australia in my van with my family. Um, and I think we often get to that places and we've got um, Neil up here jumping around, although he probably shouldn't be. And you might be sitting here going, what am I doing here? What are these people doing? And it's because we have this great faith in God, this great belief in God. And I look at this life that I could live traveling around Australia and and I'm sure that some people should be living that life and, and God said, yep, that's for you. But I know that there's many lives I could live and I'd be like, that would be awesome. But God has placed me in this direction and this path. So just an encouragement this morning. If you're at a place where you're like, oh, you know, what am I doing? What am I doing here? You are here for a purpose. You are here for a plan. And I really believe that God's going to speak to us. I told you this mic's going out. <laughs> God's going to speak to us this morning. Do we maybe need a new mic because it's cutting out? Thank you. Is this one good? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, here we go. So we are here for a plan and a purpose this morning and God's really going to speak to us. And this is the third and final week of our Like Garlic series. So right here, I have <coughs> this, this pot of dirt. And in this pot of dirt is a clove. Or is, what's the whole thing called? A bulb. A bulb of garlic. I am not a garlic expert. <laughs> Lisa gave me a quick tutorial when we went for a walk the other day and I've forgotten it all. Um, but in here is garlic. And as we've been hearing from Pastor Clinton, if you plant garlic right, that's when it'll flourish and that's when it'll turn into what it's supposed to. And we've been speaking about belief and believing in that. So what I'm telling you right now, there's garlic in there. You can't see it. But I'm telling you, actually, I didn't put it in there. So I'm believing that there's garlic in there too because <laughs> Pete put that in there. But just mull on that for a second, that in this pot is garlic. So why don't we just pray for the service this morning, for this message. Lord, we just lift you up, God. I thank you so much for this message that you've given me. I'm excited for this message, Lord. I know that it is spoken to me and it keeps speaking to me, God. So I just pray that our hearts would be open, Lord, and know that we're here for a plan and a purpose this morning and that this message is just going to speak to us and speak to our life and to our future this morning in your name. Amen. So as I am <coughs> preparing this message, I'm thinking about faith. So this is our belief series and our faith series. And I'm thinking about what faith looks like and what belief looks like and what comes to my mind. If you don't know me, I'm Sky, by the way. I do the women's. So that's why Neil was talking about me giving, I wasn't giving him dirty looks. I was just saying, I keep to a time schedule. I'm good at that. Um, and this is my husband, Pete, and we've got our two kids together. So I always think of my kids in these situations, especially when you're talking about faith and belief. You think of kids in those situations and the kind of belief and faith that kids have and the belief they have in themselves and the belief that they have in other people and in adults around them. And I look at my children and I look at Summer. If I haven't, I don't know if I've told you this story. I've told lots of people this story because it's quite funny. Um, but my little girl, she's five and she loves ballet, like loves ballet, loves everything about it. She's got all the ballet dresses that 
so I've never bought any of them, but other people have bought them her ballet dresses, ballet shoes. Lisa and Elton have bought her like two pairs of ballet shoes now. She always asks for the ballet music to be put on and she's dancing all around the house. And so many times I've asked her, for a long time now since I thought, okay, I can take you to ballet lessons, but like over a year I've asked her time and time again when she's on her own or if she's around other people, I've said to her, do you want to do some ballet lessons? Do you want me to take you to a ballet class so that you can do your dancing and things like that? And every single time, without fail, she says to me, I don't need to take a ballet class. I already know how to dance. <laughs> and it's just this beautiful belief in herself. And I remember Patricia saying one time, Ballet classes will ruin her. This girl is so free in herself and what she believes. And I'm just like, yeah, it would. She, she'd be like, nah, I can do it better than that because she's got that great belief. And another thing about um, my kids and, and most kids that I know is they like to launch themselves off things and they always believe that you're going to catch them. Like... They, the amount of times our kids have thrown themselves off something and they just expect that parents will catch them. And for our kids, it extends beyond that. They have launched themselves off this stage on so many occasions, and not just to me and Pete, but to any adult that they know and trust. So whether that's Elton, Cole, Patricia, Tim, whoever's walking by, if they know them and trust them enough, they will launch themselves off this stage and trust that they're going to be caught. And to this day, I don't think they've been dropped. So that faith will continue until one poor day <laughs> they are dropped and then it might diminish a little bit. But that's the kind of faith that I'm speaking about this morning that we can trust God that when we jump into his plans for our life, when we can jump into that moment that God's going to catch us every time. And that's the kind of trust and faith that I want to speak about this morning. <clears throat> so... We're going to be speaking a little bit about Abraham's life. I've asked a few people, what do you think of when you hear Abraham? And every single one of them has sung that song to me, Father Abraham had many sons, um, which I'm not going to sing because I'm a terrible singer. But that's what we know him for. We know him for the father to have many descendants and that sort of thing. So I'll give you a quick overview if you aren't aware or if you need a refresher on who Abraham is. So Abraham was originally called Abram. And I'll mess it up a few times when it's supposed to be Abram. But just know I'm talking about Abraham, Abram, Abraham. And he's married to Sarah, who used to be Sarai, or maybe it was just Sarah with an I, I'm not sure. But she became Sarah, he became Abraham, and that's who they were. And they struggled to have children for a long time. And God made them this promise. And it's in Genesis 15, 5, it says... Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. So imagine that promise. You're trying to have kids with your wife. It's not happening, but God's like, look up at the stars. That's how many descendants you'll have. You can't even count how many descendants you will have. Like That's an amazing promise. That's a massive promise from God. And you'd just be like, awesome. That's amazing. Thank you. So you'd be thinking, all right, Sarah, like tell Sarah what's going on or Sarah. Um, and you'd think, okay, give me a year. I'm going to have a child. Give me two years, maybe, if it takes God a bit longer. I'm going to have this child. But as we know, God doesn't always do things the way we think that God's going to do things. And we heard Pastor Lisa speak about this a month or so ago, about trusting in God and trusting in his timing. Because for Abraham, it was 25 years later. So he was 75 at the time. <laughs> It was a hundred when he got this promise fulfilled. And we see it here in Genesis 21, 1 to 3. The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. She became pregnant and she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God said that it would. And Abraham named his son Isaac. I like that. The really sticking point at just the time God said it would happen. Not in our time, not when we thought it would, not how we thought the plan would happen, but when God said it would happen. 
But still, 25 years, been waiting for this. It would be such a Simba moment where you'd have this son and you'd show the world, this is my son and I'm going to have many descendants. It would just be such an amazing feeling. And so this is where we're going to get to the, the story that I want to get to, the part in Abraham's life where my mind just blows. So we're in Genesis 22, <coughs> verses 1 to 10. And it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, really driving that point home. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, the next morning, not a week down, he didn't have to pray about it for a week, but the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took him, he took him and two of his servants with his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Am I in the right place? Yes. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I go for the boy and go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And that's where I'm stopping. He bound his son up. He took out his knife ready to slay his son. Now I look at that story and I'm like, I can't relate. Cannot relate to that. Here's this promise that you've waited 25 years, you've got this son, which God promised you. And then, you know, a few years later when Isaac can speak and things, you're like, sacrifice him. And he does. Well, he goes to. I'm just like, nah. And we look at stories like this and I'm just like, nope, can't see it. I can't relate to this. How can I have faith enough to go and to do this? And that's where we can look at these stories in the Bible and be like, this doesn't speak to me. This isn't, you know, relatable in any way. And I look at times in in my life and in mine and Pete's life and times where we've had to believe and times where we've had to have faith and times where we've doubted and we've doubted God and we've doubted that trust. And so for those of you who don't know mine and Pete's story... So we've got our two beautiful children. But before summer, we had a little girl, Grace. And we lost her when she, when I was seven months pregnant. And we had to give birth to her. And we held her in our arms. And we were heartbroken in that stage. And we had uh, a moment there, a choice to make, to trust in God, to trust in what God had promised us. Or to be like, now nah, forget this. And surprisingly... We were like, okay, God, I think because we were at that stage of just hopelessness, like we, you know, we can't do this on our own. Our hearts are broken. We've lost this, this girl that, you know, we felt like, you know, this is the, the child, our first child that we we're going to have. So we really just lent into God. We lent into the promises that he gave us and we lent into trusting him and believing in him. And even though the circumstances weren't good and even though the outcome wasn't desirable, We had a real time of believing in God and trusting in God and we grew in God and we grew together as a couple. And then fast forward. So then we have our little girl, Summer, and then I'm pregnant again. And then we have issues again. And I was very early on at this stage, so people didn't know about it. It was just me and Pete that knew that I was having a baby. Pete knew. Um, (laughs) So he he did, I promise. And anyway, so I started to have issues again and I started to bleed. And so I went into my doctor, my same doctor, and 
he had a look and he's like, oh, there's a little heartbeat, obviously very faint because it's very early on. So, you know, should be okay. We'll take some blood tests and we'll see. Took some blood tests. He calls me back and he's like, well, actually, it's not okay. Like, your hormones are so low. Like, this is low and we were, like, down here. They're not able to sustain this body. There's this baby. Your body's not able to sustain this baby. And so... <laughs> We got on these hormones and we'd come in week after week after week and be told the same thing. Like, it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Your body's not producing what it needs to produce. It's trying to get rid of this baby. And we got to this point where, again, we're like, okay, we have to trust God in this moment. And being what we've been through, you know, surely we can trust God for this. But no, I had my doubts. I had so much insecurities around this for whatever reason and I was just like, God, what's going on here? What, like, we've been through this. And because you know as well that things don't always turn out the way that you thought they were going to turn out. And so you do, you start to have these doubts and you start to go down. I went down a Googling spiral of trying to Google, trying to find hope where I wasn't going to get any. Because trust me, Google is not your best friend when you're going through things. And trying to find, um, you know, someone else's story where they've been where I am and it turned out okay and I couldn't find it. And we'd go back to the doctor again and it came to a point where he's like, I think we're just delaying the inevitable by you taking these hormones. I think your body is trying to get rid of this baby and it's going to happen. And we're just prolonging that and making it worse. So going and hearing this... I had so many doubts in my mind because I've, I've got a medical professional telling me what's going to happen. And this is the, the places that we can get to in our lives where God feels so distant and we have so many doubts about the plans he has for us and so many doubts that, that he can get us through. And so you look at this story <coughs> of Abraham and you're just like, man, like this is so far beyond what I feel right now about my faith but I'm here to tell you that there's more to this story there's more to Abraham's story he wasn't perfect all the time he didn't have perfect faith all the time and this isn't to be a downer on Abraham because he had some great moments as well but I'm just going to go through a few times where Abraham wasn't so perfect so we've got in Genesis 12:11. And it says, <coughs> as he was about to enter Egypt, so they were fleeing because of a famine, him and Sarai, um, he said to his wife, Sarah, I know that you're a beautiful woman. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for, this, for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. And so they do this, and... Um, then people tell Pharaoh what a beautiful lady she is and so they take her away to be Pharaoh's wife, not desirable. Um, but then God steps in and, and God intervenes and um, brings all kinds of bad things against Pharaoh and Pharaoh's like, be away, go away. Like, why have you brought this into my life? And it was just a moment where Abraham didn't believe that God was going to take care of them. And then we go again in Genesis 15 verse 1 to 4 and it's just Abraham speaking to God and God says do not be afraid Abraham I'm your shield your very great reward but Abram said O sovereign Lord what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who inherit my estate is Eliza of Damascus and Abraham said you have given me no children so a servant in my household will be my heir and then the Lord came to him and says that man will not be your heir but a son from your own body will be your heir and this is just a, an example of Abraham needing that reassurance from God needing to be reassured that this promise that he's been given will come to pass and then we again we've got and this is a big one in 16 verses 1 to 6 it says now now Sarah, Abram's wife, was born, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be 
his wife, he slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abraham, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. And Abram says, the servants in your hands, do with her whatever you think is best. So Sarah mistreated Hagar and she fled. This again is just a moment of them, the, this promise hasn't come yet. It hasn't come in their timing. So they're taking things into their own hands. They're thinking, oh, okay, well, if God's not doing it this way, then we're going to go this way. And this isn't to be a downer on Abraham. There's more examples of him doubting, but I won't go too much into that. This isn't to be a, a downer on Abraham and, you know, look at what he did wrong. But it's just to be realistic that he wasn't perfect. He didn't have perfect faith. He had his doubts. And so if you're sitting here this morning and you've got doubts, you've got doubts that that, that child will ever be in your arms, you've got doubts that you'll ever be happy or doubts that you're going to fulfill the purpose that God has given you, that doesn't discount you for what God has. Because the amazing thing about this story is that it's not Abraham's faith that was perfect, but it's that he served a perfect God. So even through these times, even through these times of doubt, God still brought him through. God still said, I'm not discounting you. I've still got this plan. So when you take the wrong turn and when you have those doubts, God's like, well, come on, let's go, keep going. I still got these plans and these purposes for your life because God never doubts his love for you. God never doubts his plan for you. God never doubts the purpose he has for your life. And so the point that I had to come to with um, my situation wasn't that, okay, God, make this happen. Do what I want you to do because that's not how God works. God has a plan and a purpose, but it's about trusting God when you don't see the outcome. So I had to come to that place where I was like, God, I've seen what you've done in my life. And that's where Abraham got to when he came to this point of being able to sacrifice his son because he'd gone through all this stuff and God still didn't let him down God still didn't turn his back and so that's the place I had to get to was going God I don't know what's going to happen I don't know if this is going to be a desirable outcome I've seen that things don't always go to plan in my life but I trust you with my life I trust you with my children or my future children I trust you with everything that you have planned for me and that's what I had to get to not to go God do this and then I'll trust you but God I trust you no matter what and I came back to the doctors at 14 weeks and praise God my baby was still there and my placenta had taken over so I didn't need hormones anymore and my doctor legitimately was like I can't explain it it's a miracle and that was amazing. It was just, it was an amazing moment, but the moment for me was trusting God no matter what happened. And I ended up having Harry Boy, who you all know and love, and that's it. I'm out. Um, but it's not about the, like, that miracle's amazing, and, and what we got out of that, and we got Harry, and I'm sure that God's got so many plans for Harry, and that's why he's here, not for my sake. But I believe that it was the moment of going, God, no matter what. I trust in you no matter what. I know that you have a purpose and a plan for me. And that's where our hope comes from. It's from his love and his forgiveness and his hopefulness and his reassurance. And so we come back to this story in Genesis where he's about to sacrifice this, this promise. And we, we get this in life where we have this thing in our life that we love and we've desired for so long and God's like... You need to get rid of that. You need to sacrifice that for, for some other plan that I have. And we don't always know what that plan is. In this case, it was an awesome outcome. <laughs> so this, we're at the point where he reached for the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. 
Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. And that's the God that we serve Abraham got to this point where he's like, I trust him. I trust in his provision. I trust him with my life because I've seen it time and time again. And so while the story is still hard to swallow, he knew that God would provide for him. He knew that God would make a way. He didn't know what it looked like. Just like in here, we don't know what's growing underneath there. But as Pastor Clinton is speaking about, if you plant it in the right way, you can trust that that's going to grow into what it's supposed to And I'm not going to take it out because it might be planted the wrong way. I don't know. And it's dirty. But it's trusting in the unseen. And that's what we read here in Hebrews 11, 1. It says, faith shows, might get coal up if you can. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of the things we cannot see. And that's what this is, faith like garlic, as this series is. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. And trusting in God with our whole heart looks like having that faith like a child, that freedom that if you jump into his plans, if you jump into his purpose, that he's not going to put that to shame. He's going to catch you every time. And then it's getting to the finish line, like we heard Pastor Clinton speak about with his mum. It's getting to that finish line and knowing where you're going, knowing that you've lived this this beautiful life and it's had its ugliness and it's had its beauty in it but knowing where your eternity is set that's what belief is and I've had the privilege of witnessing um, Pete's family and his dad going through um, his brain tumor and his treatment and things like that and it's been a year and a half now and the guy's still doing really well but he's listening to him throughout the whole thing say to us like he's not like I'm ready to go or anything like that. He's still, you know, young man. But he's saying, I've done everything I've needed to. So if this is it, then he's okay with that. He's okay with going to God. We're not okay with it. We still want him around. But that alone has been a miracle watching that. And he's going to come off treatment now because they're like, what else can we do? He's, He's doing amazing. But it's that belief and that faith in what God has done in his life and what his eternity is going to look like and that's what faith looks like that's what belief looks like so I just think that this um this verse that I have at the end it's a faith verse but it's also it's not just for people that you know are committing their life to God but it's that everyday believing in what God has for us every day, believing the plans that he has because every single one of us need that because every single one of us have doubts. It's not a good place to be in. I've been in both of having belief when things are going bad or and needing belief. And it's better to be in that place of having belief and believing in God because when you turn to other things, it's just hopelessness. So this is just a reminder because it happens to all of us that when we have those moments of doubt and when we have those moments of disbelief, God is the only thing that's going to get us through that. God's the only thing that's going to help us to persevere. So this verse right here, Romans 10, 8 to 13, it says, The message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that's the thing right here. It says you need to believe it in your heart, but you also need to declare that. There's this Colin Buchanan song that the kids listen to, and it's um, there's no such thing as an invisible believer. And that song has struck me more than some of the songs we sing at church sometimes, because <laughs> that's like every moment of our lives, you can't be an invisible believer. You need to declare who God is in your life. And I struggle sometimes with that. I need to be reminded. That's why it's such a good song. It's so catchy. 
that you can't be an invisible believer. You need to declare who God is because for some people, you might be the only voice. You might be the only one telling them who God is. So it's believing in your heart and it's declaring with your mouth that that's when you'll be saved. As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. And that's what I was speaking about. If we believe in what God has in the unseen, because sometimes we don't know when or where or how that's going to happen. But it says that if you believe in him, you will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. So anyone can have this. They have the same Lord. We all share the same Lord. There's only one King, only one Lord, who gives generously to all who call on him. So everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So this morning, um, this is great timing, and I think that's because Pastor Clinton planned it to be. We've got our baptism service next week, and this isn't a small thing, this is a massive thing. So if you are baptized and coming along, keep that in your your hearts and your prayers but this is a massive thing to know who God is to know who he is in your heart to declare who he is so if you're sitting here and you're like I'm not even sure anymore I'm not sure why I'm here if you've never given your life or if you have but you're really not sure about your relationship with God then this is your moment this is the time where you can say to God you know what Like, I want this. I want this trust in you, this faith in you that's like Abraham that just knows where God's going to take you, know that God's going to provide for you. So we're going to pray together. I might just get everyone to stand to their feet and get the band to come up. (laughs) I'm going to pray this prayer and I want everyone to pray it with me. And if you would like to come up, and speak to one of the leaders here or you'd like some prayer or that's the first time you've you've given that prayer and you really believe that in your heart we'd love to pray for you and we'd love to chat to you about baptism next week good timing so why don't we just close our eyes and we're going to say this prayer together heavenly father forgive me of all my sins make me brand new i believe jesus died for me and rose again so I could live for you. Fill me with your spirit so I could know you, serve you and follow you the rest of my life. My life is not my own. Today I give it to you. Thank you for new life. In the name of Jesus, amen. And then as we sing that last song this morning, I just, this moment, I don't want this moment to pass us by because I really feel that there's some people in here this morning that as Taylor said earlier, need to do some business with God. We need to step out with God this morning and say, God, we believe in the plans that you have for me. God, I believe and I trust in you. Things might not be looking great at the moment. I don't know where we're gonna go, but God, I trust in you. I believe in you. I believe in your promises to me. I believe in your faithfulness to me. So this morning, if you would like prayer for that, If you don't want to come forward, stick up your hand. We'll come to you because I really believe this morning that we can't let this moment pass us by because living in His faith, living in His promise, there's no other place that's better. I know when we were at CrossFit, one of our coaches say that this next 15 minutes is going to be the best of your life. Well, let me tell you that every moment we have with God, every opportunity we have to to worship God, to pray with God, that is the best moment of your life. And if this is something that's gonna get you closer to God this morning, I just want you to take that opportunity. Don't let it pass you by because you're not sure, you're embarrassed or you don't know what to say. If you don't wanna say, that's fine. We'll pray for you anyway. We just want you to have this moment with God. If you don't feel like you've ever experienced, like you might have said, yeah, God, I believe in you and I believe in what you can do, but you don't feel like you've ever experienced that true heart relationship with 
with God this morning, then I want you to come forward so that we can pray for you. Or if you're in a spot right now where you're doubting what God can do, you're doubting where you're going, then we wanna pray for you this morning. Do not let this moment pass you by. So why don't we just sing that and why don't you come out so that we can pray for you this morning, Jesus' name. In the presence of my enemies. I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. Yes, I'll raise a